Today, I want to, the title of my message is, uh, Whatever It Takes Faith. Say that with me, Whatever It Takes Faith. And um, I want us to be whatever it takes, people. Whatever it takes, faith. Um, we'll, we'll open the Bible, uh, open your Bible to Mark chapter 2. Jesus has, uh, let's just kind of, let's kind of parachute down into the first century here in uh, northern Israel, in the Galilee, Galilean area, where Jesus has begun his ministry after John the Baptist, you know, he baptized him. He went before him, chapter 1 of Mark, or as we would say in Massachusetts, Mark. Um, any Marks here? Hey, Mark. Any Marks? Okay. Oh, there's a Mark here. Um, and then, uh, you know, he was baptized. All that went with that. He was tempted of Satan. He overcame that test. Um, and then he began to call his first disciples, and he began to teach with such authority that everybody, he was like a magnet. Wherever he went, his teaching was powerful. He would heal the sick. Jesus, wherever he went, it says in chapter 1, verse 33, the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons. I love this. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. So all of this stuff, he's healing, he's preaching the gospel. Um, and so he, what he does is he has to keep going into desolate places because it's important for him to pray. And every time Jesus gets away to pray, to be with the Father, um, miracles happen when he comes out of that. Like his teaching is so anointed and so powerful. You have to understand, you have a Father in heaven that loves you, and he loves it when you're with him. He loves when you come to him with your problems. He loves when you come to him with petitions. He loves when you come to him with praise, and we can bless his name. And so Jesus always got a way to be with his Father, and then he would emerge with the power and the anointing to do kingdom work, and everybody's life for change. So... Um, it says this, uh, it ends, chapter 1 ends with uh, verse 45. But he went out and began to talk freely about it. This is a guy that he just uh, healed a leper. And it spread, and he spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. So there's, I want to declare something. There's never been anyone in history that has, has more um, prominence his name has more provenance than anybody that has ever lived, and his name is Jesus. He's still attracting billions of people are still bowing their knees to surrender to Christ because our Jesus, who died on a cross, is not still in the grave. Christ rose from the dead. He was seen by over 500 witnesses. He is alive, and his spirit is poured into every heart of people who believe in him. So he is just as powerful today, only uh, Jesus said, uh, greater works shall you do that I've been doing. You will do the works I've been doing and even greater because I'm going to the Father. And so what he means by that is there's going to be a whole lot more of you right now in the world, two billion followers of Jesus. Do you think that we can reach the other five? Yes. You better believe it. So um, anyways, I'm getting carried away and I need to just calm down a little bit. So let's look at the chapter 2, verse 1. It says this. And when he returned to Capernaum, you need to know about, everybody say Capernaum. Capernaum. Capernaum was the home base, probably where Peter lived, his mother-in-law, perhaps her house. But he, 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 he was already moving around Galilee. Now he's coming home. It says, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Guess what's going to happen now? It's getting reported that he's home. What do you think is going to happen? And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. This house, man, talk about a life group. A small, a, a small group became a massive group. And, um, and he was preaching the word to, him, to them. Can you imagine? We talked about kind of parachuting down. And imagine just being in that room, being in that house. Like Jesus is the Bible teacher. Just imagine. And man, everybody's coming. There's gathered. The, the house is packed. Uh, standing room only, and there's people outside the door. They just want to see if they can just catch a little bit of what he's saying. And it's so packed out. And, and then it says this, and they came, who's they? You'll find out, bringing to him a paralytic 
carried by four men. So they, they're four guys must love their friend, whoever he is to them. They go and they go, Jesus is home. We're bringing you. We're going to bring you. We're going to do whatever it takes because we have whatever it takes faith. We're bringing you. Now, when they get there, it says, um, uh, and when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof. Come on, somebody. I, I was a roofer for some time. Any, any roofers? Okay, good. I'm in a great company. I was a roofer for some time. And um, I used to work on three-deckers in Dorchester and Milton, all over the place, South Shore. You know, we would get these jobs in the winter. Uh, and do you know what it's like? You know, God bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you because what you do is awesome. Without roofers, we would not be able to exist. Um, so I used to strip, you know, sometimes it'd be two layers or three. It was miserable, like it was hard work. First you shovel the roof, then you take the shingles off or the flat, whatever it was. And uh, it was hard work. I mean, it's radical to do that. And here these guys are like, oh, we can't get in? Let's just take the roof off. <laughs> Good idea. I can imagine my triplets like coming up with that. Good idea. Yeah, let's just take the roof off. Um, <laughs> years ago um, because of the crowd so they removed the roof above him and when they had made an opening this is so this is so awesome they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay so they got ropes they got who knows like they're like come on let's get him right down there there's Jesus okay yeah we got the perfect hole here lower him down and Jesus is preaching and he's like Brrr. hey what's your name <laughs> right so these guys are radical. I love them so much. And, uh, and when Jesus saw their faith, you see, that's faith. Who is their faith in? Their faith is in Jesus. And they know they've got a paralyzed friend. How many of you know that we can be paralyzed by a lot of things? Guilt, shame, fear, anxiety. Aim, an aimless life. We're not moving forward. We feel like we just are stuck. Anybody ever been stuck? Well, it, there's lots of people like that, by the way. Right now, especially since this pandemic started, there are people stuck, and they need people like the four friends that'll say, I'll come alongside because I love you, and I'll carry you if I have to, but I'm going to get you to Jesus in some way possible. I care about you because I love people, because the love of God is in me. So these guys are literally doing all this, and Jesus said, he, he, it says he saw their faith. You know, when we step out and do unusual things, creative things, you know, the Spirit of God will birth an idea in your heart when you are in his presence. And by the way, we should be absorbed with God's agenda. We should be completely uh, thinking about, praying about the Great Commission and how we can participate. Because I know whenever I go to be with Jesus, there's one thing that he's going to hold me accountable to. Did I use my gifts? Did I share my faith? Did I serve him? And I want to hear these words, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. Servant, well done. So, um, he says this, he saw their faith, but he says something that they didn't expect. Son, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. What would you expect the God, the Son of God, God the Son, to say to you if you were lowered down and you were looking at him face to face? Would you expect that? He knows everything about you. He knows every thought. That's scary. You know, the writer of Hebrews chapter 4 says this. That um, you know, we will, we will. Uh, that he knows, he knows our thoughts, he knows our intentions of the heart, he he knows it all, and he says, and um, we must give account. All, oh, it says, all things lay naked and bare to him to which we must all give an account to. Like, whoa, that's scary. But then the writer of Hebrews points us to the great high priest. 
And he says, but Jesus Christ, your high priest, he came. And you know what? He laid his life down so that when we do face Jesus, we can, look, we can remember he's the high priest. Not only is he high priest, but he's also the sacrifice. He shed his blood for our sins. So Hebrews writer wants us to know that. So then he says, so let us come boldly before the throne of grace so that we might receive help and find mercy in our time of need. That's what Jesus would look at you. And he would say, you, do you think he'd say, you rotten sinner, you disgusting excuse of a person, get out of my sight. What he said to the paralytic, but by the way, sometimes there is a biblical connection, if you read the Old Testament and others, that sometimes sin brings about, not always, that's heresy to think that, but sometimes sin will bring about physical problems. Sometimes, not all the time. So you can't say that if somebody's having a fit, oh, you must be a sinner. Don't say that. That's what Job's counselor said. Don't say that. But sometimes it does. So even James says, um, you know, if you come to God, confess your sins, you know, um, if they lay hands on the sick, they will, they will be healed and their sins will be forgiven. So sometimes there's a connection. So Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. I want you to know something today. If Jesus were walking among us and you opened your heart to Jesus, repent for your sin and believe, he would walk among all of us. and He would say, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Why? Because he knows your heart. He knows where you're at. Other people might judge you, but if, if you truly are repentant and you believe that Jesus provided the sacrifice, he may say that to you, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. But that was a big surprise. Why did the four friends bring their paralytic buddy? Why did they bring him? Because they expected Jesus to what? Heal. Heal. But Jesus surprised everybody. He says, your sins are forgiven. Now, why did he forgive his sins before he healed this man? And even the the scribes that were there, let's read this. Um, Son, your sins are forgiven now, verse 6. Some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Of course, if you understood the scriptures, anybody, only God can forgive sins because they said, who can forgive sins but God alone? So they're, they're accurate. The scribes are accurate. Only God can forgive sins. Only God can declare your sins all forgiven, right? So they're right about that. But now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus question within themselves because Jesus knows even your thoughts. He knows it. Um, he says, why do you, he said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Now watch, three words. I want you to say these three words nice and loud with me. Ready? Which is easier? Say it again. Which is easier? To say that the, para, to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take your bed and walk? Good question, right? That's a great question. Which is easier? Which is easier for Jesus to do? Hmm. That's, you know, if you ponder that, you go, well, I don't know. I mean, it's both difficult to do, right? What he's declaring himself is he's God. And this blew the scribes and the Pharisees away. No one, there's only one God, they would say. So they're already going to plan his execution because they see him as a blasphemer. And in their law, blasphemers must be stoned. So they're already going to start the evil intentions because here's the thing. Here's the thing. You ready? You back, back there, you guys ready? You see, they closed their heart to the idea of Jesus being God and their Savior. They already closed. Some of you have closed your heart to Jesus. Maybe you were dragged in here against your will. <laughs> Sorry. I just think it's hilarious. Somebody else does too. I like that laugh. Whoever had that. Like a wheezy kind of laugh, I like that. Like Pastor Gary Closter used to do. Um, sorry, Gary, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, back to the point. Is 
Some of you have already closed your heart to Jesus. Can I just tell you that's the most dangerous thing? There's nothing more dangerous than shutting, hardening your heart to Christ. Nothing more dangerous for your, your eternal future. God loves you so much, despite your past, despite your evil deeds. He loves you. And he wants you to know that you too can have your sins forgiven. But back to the question, which is easier? Which is easier, your sins forgiven or to say rise, take your bed and walk? I want to, I, I want to propose this to you. I believe that Jesus is pointing to the cross because in order for him to have the authority to forgive sins, he is going to the cross for your sins because your sins, my sins, demand and deserve justice and judgment. So guess what? Jesus is, I think the answer to Jesus' question is, it's harder to go to the cross. It's harder to forgive sins because you, he's going to go to the cross. And he's going to the cross because that's why he came to do that. So he could save us. Because your sins demand just judgment. And Jesus is the one that took all of humanity's judgment upon himself so that we, so that our sins could be judged and God's justice is done and reconciliation can come through Christ. You can only be saved by the grace of God through the cross of Christ, not by your works. Otherwise, you'd brag about your own salvation. Jesus came to do that. So which is easier? And then he goes on to say this. This is, this is the main point, right? He says, but that you may know, everyone, the scribes, the Pharisees, everyone, that you may know that the Son of Man, that's a, a title of deity, has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed that he had had for his, perhaps his whole life, I don't know how long, and he went out before them all, and they were all amazed, and they all glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this, including the scribes. They were all amazed. They're like, what? I love what the NIV, how the NIV puts it. It says, he took up his mat, walked out in full view of them all. He's like, he's like, <laughs> hanging on the ropes, hey Jesus. And then he gets up. He's like, and he walks out. He's like, I'm out. See ya. <laughs> you see, you may have been carried in. Maybe somebody carried you in. Maybe you've been so discouraged. Maybe the consequences of sin have been such a burden to you. Maybe somebody just said, just come to Jesus. Let me tell you the story. Let me give you some hope. Let me, let me just encourage your heart because you don't have to stay stuck in that place of paralysis. You can actually get back on your feet and you can get your life moving again. You don't have to stay stuck in your sin. You don't have to stay stuck in the, in the memories of your past. But there's a king... There's a God who took care of that for you, and he will forgive every sin. He will erase it and cast it into the deepest sea, and he will get you back up on your feet so you can move on with your life, and you don't have to stay stuck in the past because Jesus took care of that. How many of you want to uh, walk out like he did? And then he got to live the life that he was created to live. There's a lot of stuff that happens to us. Man, I'll tell you what, when I got that news and I was sitting in that stairway, stairwell in between services that my brother died, that was hard. That was, it's been hard. It's been really hard. I'm experiencing a level of grief that I never have. It's when, you know, when your parents die, that's a level of grief. When your siblings die, that's a different one. When your child dies, that's a really hard one. But I'll tell you what, I am always looking at death through the perspective of what Jesus did. He died on F Good Friday. We always say, why do we call it Good Friday? He died on Friday, but he rose on Sunday. And everyone in Christ who dies will live again. And the Bible says, 
uh, to be absent from this body is to be present immediately with the Lord. So why would I stay depressed? I'm, I'm, listen, I'm going through it, and it's hard, and that's, that's, that's just the price of love. Grief is the price of love, and it's, grief is human. You should grieve. We're gonna, I'm going to miss him tremendously. Every, every day, practically, we text. Every, we constantly talk. I've never once been alienated or separated from my brother Peter. Even when, when our family went through a divorce, my parents divorced, it just grew our bond closer. I've never, ever been distant. We've always been connected. So I just don't have them there every day. And that's really hard. But you know what? It lights a greater fire in my spirit because his sudden death reminds me that everyone has a, a day of mortality. Everyone has a day, an appointed time. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. So there's a day for all of us, and it lights a fire in me, and I'm renewed, and I'm restored, and I'm ready to go. I will hurt, I will cry, but I am going to be even more committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God for salvation. Can I get a witness? Oh my gosh, I love you too, so much. And by the way, who said that? Raise your hand. I love you, Jen. Uh, by the way, we are absolutely overwhelmed by the amount of cards, texts, phone calls. Thank you for being such a loving congregation, not just to us, but the way you love one another. The meals team, the cards, all of the beautiful love that you guys. Welcome to New Hope if you're new. You're gonna love this church. And by the way, our values are that we pour grace on everyone and we don't judge anybody. We just preach the truth and we love people with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength as we love God. Oh, praise God. So the emphasis of this text, and everybody needs to hear this, is on forgiveness. The for Jesus was just allowing this dramatic scene because he wants us to know that though we are full of sin, he's come to forgive us. And it's hard to go to the cross. Mostly just kind of for that time where separation from the Father for that time, uh, for that short time, he had been with the Father. And, you know, as, you know, the Father had to turn his face away when sin came down on his son. And that was probably the most difficult point to the point where the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was sweating drops of blood. The stress was so stressful that that blood, he was coming out of his forehead. And he did it. He endured that for us. So um, Jesus had a whatever it took mindset. The four guys had a whatever it takes faith mindset. Do you have a whatever it takes kind of faith? So that people, you know, like those four guys, you're like, you know what? I know people that need Jesus. I work with them. They're my friends. They're my relatives. Um, they're my coworkers. They're, they're my neighbors. I know they need Jesus. Now, my question is, how can we not share our story, our testimony, our message with people that need it. We cannot allow all this life to go by without us sharing the good news of Jesus. You know, gospel means uh, it's news. And then there's a, there's a Greek word that puts joy in front of news. So Jesus came preaching the joyful news or the good news. They call it good tidings, glad tidings joyful news and your friends need that your friends need that and and this is what it means jesus says this he said if you want to find your life please hear these words you got to lose it for my sake and the gospel you got to lose your life in other words surrender everything and prioritize jesus his for his sake and his gospel, and that's when you find your life. Amen. Apart from Jesus, go ahead, just give that praise to God. <laughs> apart from Jesus, apart from Jesus, you will not find your life. You will not find your life. You will not live the life that God intended you to live. But when you surrender, you go, 
All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I give it. I'm done. I give. I give. I'm done trying to live my own life. I give. And then when that guy picked up his mat and he got up, you know what the mat was? The mat was his testimony. This is who I used to be. See this mat? It's who I used to be. I'm no longer that anymore. And imagine what it was like when he told that story everywhere he went. People came to Jesus, guaranteed. And, and you have a mat of your own. You have a story of your own that needs to be told. Your story is the greatest story for you. Your test became, becomes now your testimony. Your mess. Raise your hand if you were living in a mess, or maybe still are. Your mess, when you give it to Jesus, will turn it into a message. You'll say, this is what I was dealing with, and sometimes I still struggle, but I'm trusting Christ. I'm giving everything to him. I'm throwing it all on the line. All the chips are in. And and, and God will use your life, and you can be a whatever-it-takes faith person with that kind of mindset. Jesus was the first one. The cross is proof. The four friends, when they brought their love and their faith They brought their friend to Jesus because they knew if I can just get him to Jesus, he's never going to be the same. And they were so right. So we we know that sin, guilt, shame, aimlessness, purposelessness, all is like a form of paralysis, and we know what to do about it. So I'm going to give you three quick things in these closing moments. Write them down. Whatever it takes faith is a persistent faith. It's a faith... To, for sharing the gospel, right? Like the four, like it's a faith that will not give up. I will not stop sharing the good news of Jesus. I'll pray for my friends. By the way, you have to pray. You have to be in a relationship with Jesus. You have to be on your knees in, because he's going to reveal things. He's going to show you. He's going to power you. I'm going to pray for them. I'm not going to give up. I don't, there, how many of you formally would, be, would have been considered a hard case never to come to Jesus in your past life. Oh, look at all of you. You see, you weren't that tough, were you? (laughs) Not tougher than Jesus. (laughs) Don't give up just because some people have declined your invite, declined your invite to church or declined your invite to to let them tell you a story. You know what? If you listen to other people's stories, if you'd like listen to people, let them tell their story, they will give you permission for you to tell your story. Because we got to pray for people. Then we got to care for people. But then there comes time where we just have to dare. So we get to the point where we share our faith. Prayer. Hit, uh, prayer, care, dare, share. Those are easy ways to remember it. Um, persistent. You know, Mim Anderson. And remember Al Anderson. He helped us get this church going. Powerful elder. Mighty man of God. Do you know for what? 12 years or however long it was he she got saved and he refused to she never gave up praying for him sharing her faith with him trusting God and one day Al surrendered his life to Jesus and he became a kingdom shaker he he helped us build this church never give up persistent faith whatever it takes faith is persistent faith whatever it takes faith is creative faith creative Imagine watching these guys dismantling the roof, going, man, I, I should have thought of that. I could have brought my friend down there. <laughs> right? By the way, nobody got mad at him. Did, I don't see any, any in the story where people, the, the owner of the house got mad. Um, creative faith. You know, God will give you creative ideas, big and small. Sometimes they're small. My daughter, Melissa, said, I'm going to... I'm going to bake pies for my neighbors. She wanted to show them the love of Christ. And she baked good pies. She didn't go get, you know, Shaw's lemon meringue, you know. <laughs> like it was homemade good pies. And then she started giving it to her, to her neighbors. And her neighbors loved them. And they listened to them. And they opened doors for them to plant gospel seeds. So we, we did a whole thing at the church, a whole campaign. Pie it forward campaign. Everybody was baking pies. Everybody was giving them to the neighbors. You can be creative. You know, that's a small thing, but a big thing, if anybody ever hear of Bill Bright, Campus Crusade for Christ, Bill Bright 
reach millions. He had, he had uh, campus ministries all over, and campuses, universities, colleges. Anyways, he decided that, he said, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna be able to share faith with the whole world by making this, he had an idea, to make a Jesus film. And so he got you know, his goals down, his vision down, he shared his vision, they raised the money, and his goal was to get it in 163 languages. So it could go everywhere. We've got a guy that comes to New Hope and he goes to Africa, and he has a motorcycle, a solar panel, and he brings a Jesus movie to the most remote parts of Africa, Louis. His name is Louis. And he just gets on his bike and drives throughout Africa. And he sets up a portable system. People watch the movie and they come to faith in Christ. It's amazing. But this was Bill Bright's idea. Now here's what happened over time. Remember his goal was, seven, was 163 languages he wanted to get it in? It's basically a movie about the life of Christ as the Gospel of Luke portrays it and tells it. And so, you know, about how Jesus came to redeem the world. They blew past that goal of 160 languages. You know how many languages they got it in? 1,700 languages. Now here's the thing. And listen, and so far up to this point, 572 million people have indicated decisions for Christ after viewing that film. One vision, a man who prays, a man that hears from God. Do you know what God wants to do with you? He wants to, to stir up ideas creatively because you are talking about the eternal destiny of people's souls. The Bible does not give good news to those who reject Jesus. It's very depressing. It's, it's that you, Jesus said, you will perish. If you do not believe in Christ, you are condemned already. God doesn't send yourself, you to hell. Jesus came to keep you from hell. You send yourself to hell whenever you reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the provision that God gives so that we can be in heaven. And what a radical provision for a father to give up his very own son. What a God we serve. So it, it, whatever it takes, faith is persistent faith. It's creative faith. Lastly, it's sacrificial faith. There's no doubt that that demolition cost them money. I mean, you dismantle a roof, you better be ready to put it back together. And we, we know that they would have. But compared to the cost of rebuilding the roof, how can you measure the price of one soul that experienced the forgiveness of Jesus and the healing of Christ? How can, we, how can we say, no, I don't want to give to the campaign. I, I don't, I, I'm not going to give all the church ever wants is money. They just want my money. We don't want your money. God doesn't need your money at all. He knows how to move the kingdom forward without you. It's just that you get to be part of it. You get to use your resources that God gave you, the abilities, the gifts, the skills to accumulate money and income. And Jesus, the Bible teaches thoroughly all the way through that the generous man will be blessed by God. So, you know, you don't have to believe that and you can stay, keep your money in your wallet. We don't need it. But I'll tell you what, it's so awesome to say I will be part of sacrificially making the kingdom of God and the gospel advancement a priority in my life to the point where I will sacrifice things that I love for something I love more, which is to see souls come into the kingdom of God and see people get liberated and free with the gospel of Christ. So whatever it takes, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, however it might change my life, it might, it might interrupt some of my comforts and some of my aspirations, but I have to put his kingdom first, 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 first. First, whatever it takes. Faith. Persistent, creative, sacrificial. And do you know what you get to be part of? The second thing is whatever it takes faith for point two is, is it, leads, it leads to you helping people find forgiveness in Christ. That's an eternal gift that God partners with us in to bring forgiveness. No more are they enemies of God. No more are they adversaries. No more are they alienated from God. They are forever coming into the kingdom, forever adopted into God's family because you said, I want in on that. 
I don't want to just be a spectator. I want to be an active participant. And, um, you know, you say to yourself, why did God, why did Jesus forgive him before he healed him? Wasn't, you know, he came for the healing. He thought that was his greatest need. He thought, my greatest need is to be healed. If I'm healed, then I'm going to be happy all my life. You might say, if I just get the boyfriend or the girlfriend, then I'm going to be happy. And they show no interest in you. And your whole life unravels. You go, whatever happened, God, you don't love me. That's bull. He loves you. He's probably saving you from a a horrible future. Um, But we think if I get the car, if I get the job, if I get the income, if I have this, if I have that, if I have that wife, that husband, then I'm going to be happy. No, you won't. Listen to Tom Brady. June 2005, Tom Brady famously said in 60 Minutes interview, why do I have three Super Bowl rings? I know he has more now. I get that. This was 2005. And still think there's something greater out there for me. I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man. This is what it is. I reach my goal, my dream, my life. But me, I think, God, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this can't be what it's cracked up to be. Tom Brady. Who doesn't love Tom Brady? Who doesn't want to be like Tom Brady? TB the GOAT, number 12. We don't say around here, Tampa Bay. We don't say that because he's through and through a patriot. We all know that, right? But, you know, but who, listen, I'm going to tell you something. If you have Jesus, but you never have anything like the life of Tom Brady, you're further ahead than he is without Christ. And what should we do about that? We should pray for the goat. Because he really needs to know the true goat. The true, the greatest of all time is Jesus Christ. Nobody surpasses him. And Tom Brady needs him just as much as anybody else. And sometimes it's harder, Jesus said, for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is to get a camel through the eye of a needle. Literally a needle, the little hole in the needle. Not some hole in the wall. This is a... He's saying, then he goes like this, but nothing is impossible with God. So you keep praying. You keep, you keep sharing your faith with those. It seems so hardened and so tough. I've seen the toughest ones break down and cry and weep because they finally surrender to Jesus. And I hope you do today. But my goal for this message is that we could all have a passion for souls, a burden for souls, and that we would participate and helping people move forward. We would be persistent, creative, sacrificial in our faith because when Jesus moves people forward, they have sins forgiven. They have guilt gone, past erased, shame undone, peace ruling, and calling is certain. And that's what we give as a gift when we partner with God in advancing the gospel of the kingdom of God. We will do anything short of sin to reach people for Jesus. I want to just close with this message, and then we're going to pray over Katie, if Katie can come up. Is Katie here? Katie? There she is. Um, I want to tell you this story real quick here. Um, John Har- Har- Do you ever hear of John Harper? Ever heard the story of John Harper's last convert? John Harper visited Moody Church in Chicago, a famous church. If you're invited to speak there, then you, you are a prince of preachers he was an evangelist a powerful evangelist and he went he spent three months in chicago every single night doing revival services and they were powerful well it was so good so many people came to faith that he was invited back to come to moody he lived over there across the pond and he was invited to come back and so um, he decided to come back and he brought his sister and his daughter, six-year-old daughter, and they found themselves on the great ship, the Titanic. He was coming back to preach. He was coming back to do more revival because he, he would pray. He had a passion. He would weep over souls. Many people came to faith because of one man who loved God and loved people. And so 
So it was that John Hopper, his sister and his six-year-old daughter, found themselves on the Titanic. Survivors later reported that as the Titanic began to sink, listen to this, Harper admonished people to be, be prepared to die. He made sure his sister and his daughter were in a lifeboat, even as he continued to share the gospel with whoever would listen. And he found himself in the icy water with a life jacket floating near another man. Harper asked, and by the way, the man that he did this to came back to a reunion later and told the whole story. Harper asked this man, are you saved? And the man said, no, I'm not saved, the desperate man replied. Harper said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Harper shouted, he's, he's in the icy waters. He's proclaiming the gospel. He's, and then one report says that Harper, knowing that he would not survive long in the icy water, took off his life jacket, threw it to another person with the words, you need this more than I do. And moments later, Harper disappeared beneath the water. Four years later, there was a reunion of the Titanic, and the man to whom Harper had witnessed told the story of his rescue and gave a testimony of his conversion, recorded in a track, John Harper's last convert. That track went out to millions of people. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. John Harper goes down in history as one of the greatest evangelists. His daughter follow Jesus his granddaughter follows Jesus they all came to a reunion 40 years later and they testified about the impact and the power of one man's life and that can be you one man one woman doing something great for Jesus I wonder if you would be that person I want to give an opportunity if you want that forgiveness that Jesus would look at you and say son daughter your sins are forgiven I want to give you that opportunity right now, whether you're online or whether you're right here in person. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer, but it's heartfelt and it must be authentic. If you're repented for all your sin, because God knows everything, and you just want to repent and believe that Christ paid the price for your sin, you can be in God's family, in his kingdom, never ever to wonder or worry if you are, if you're going to to Jesus when you die. You can know that you know and have a full assurance of salvation. Pray this prayer with me right out loud. It's simple. You're admitting you're a sinner. You believe Jesus died and rose again, and you're confessing that he's Lord. And then I'm going to ask you, if you prayed this prayer for the first time, to simply put your hand up. We're not going to make a spectacle out of you, but I want you to begin today uh, not being ashamed of your God, your Savior, but to just put your hand straight up. So let's pray nice and loud. Christian, if you want to join them, to give them the courage to say it out loud, nice and loud. Here we go. Father God, Father God, this is my prayer to you. I'm a sinner, and I repent for my sin. I really do. I believe you provided salvation through your only son, Jesus. And I believe he died for my sin on that cross. But on the third day, he rose again and he lives right now that same Jesus who lives I confess you are my Lord beginning today and from this day forward in Jesus name amen